With the Investing News Network, I'm Scott Tibbles, and today I'm reporting from the floor of the International Mining and Resources Conference. Joining me now is Dr. Elizabeth Croft, who's Dean of the Faculty of Engineering at Monash University. Thank you for joining me, Elizabeth. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So today you, were, you made a presentation on creating transformative change in the future mining workforce. Can you tell me about what you were talking about? Certainly. What I'm very concerned about is that Australia produces far too many uh, engineers, I'm sorry, Australia produces far too few engineers. Um, we are third or fourth lowest in the OCED index in terms of the percentage of engineers graduating from tertiary education. This means that we do not have enough engineers uh, to go into our resources sector, our infrastructure sector, our burgeoning uh, tech and biotech sectors, our growing clean energy sector. We have massive opportunities in this country where we need engineers to do this work, to develop our resources, to make them sustainable and to deliver to our economy. And we are under producing as a nation. We are far, we do have a lot of international um, people coming both temporarily and permanently to work, but our dependence on that is very high. And any change in our global economic relationships could significantly impinge in our ability to deliver on our economic development in this country. The reason that we are so low in the production of engineers is that um, when we uncapped university growth, um, we did not do enough good enough job of encouraging people to come and study engineering. One of the big things that changed over the last 10 to 15 years is the increase in the number of women who are going to university. That is a fantastic thing. Unfortunately, when they came to university, um, instead of inviting them into engineering, they chose to go into healthcare, science, and other areas. We did not do a good enough job of explaining the value proposition and the opportunity to women to study engineering. And so they did not come. We as a profession failed in converting un students graduating from high school into engineers. That was a mistake. But now the challenge is we're here. We are underproducing by 6,100 per year the number of engineering graduates that we should have in this country. So we're underproducing. We're at risk with our international uh, engineers coming over. And the number of places is declining for domestic students. So we have hit a perfect storm where we can't produce any more domestic because the government has capped uh, funding for domestic places. Um, we are at risk of, of not having enough people coming from overseas. And the growth in the opportunities is actually exponential. If you look at the growth curve for infrastructure development in Australia, it is Amazing. There's so much opportunity in infrastructure, in rail, the recovery of the mining sector, as I mentioned, clean energy, uh, biotech, and the, the overall tech boom requires us to deliver high quality trained engineers. And my hands are tied and I cannot do it. And I need industry help to make the case so that we increase the number of engineers that we're graduating. And that is what I am asking the help of this sector for. And what can the sector do to help? So what I need the, to, the sector to do is take this message with me to government. So I am looking for any uh, CEO, COO, CT, CTO, anybody with 
with a business card, who is willing to walk with me to take this message to the Minister of Industry and the Minister of Education and say, we need to educate more engineers. We need to make places for engineers. And we need to make them all across the country. We need to make them in the cities. We need to make them in the, in the regional areas. So we're at IMARC and you're talking to the mining sector. What are you saying to them to convince them that this is an issue? What are the long-term problems for the mining sector in Australia with too few engineers? Uh, failure to deliver on large projects. <laughs> Let's just really be honest. The problem we have right now is that uh, mining companies are screaming out for engineering talent and they cannot find it. They are recruiting all around the world and they're competing uh, with other uh, nations around the world that are producing more talent but want to keep it at home. They are um, yeah, there's just not enough engineers. And the challenge and the thing that I actually worry about is um, with all of these opportunities, more and more as a country, we are going to have to outsource the work to foreign uh, engineering companies that will come in and do the work for us. And so instead of having our engineering companies and our kids being able to take the opportunity to do those jobs, we're going to have uh, people from all around the world eating our lunch. So it's, it's a matter of national economic security to increase the number of engineers uh, that are being domestically produced in Australia. Is this a uniquely Australian issue? Well, if you look at the data, yeah, we're at the bottom end of the OECD. If you look at other similar countries, have a look at Canada. Canada is way up there in the percentage of um, engineers uh, that are coming out of universities. You know, they're up there with uh, Germany and the Nordic countries. They're on the right-hand side of, of the graph, and we're down at the bottom end. So that is a real problem. Um, and it is, yeah, it's an Australian problem. For a modern, uh, very, uh, with a very talented um, uh, group of people, like kids in Australia are really smart. We have um, really great kids, but we are not um, making the places available for them and we're not encouraging them to go. So we as a school, obviously we have to get out there and recruit them, but we also have to have the places to put them. And right now I am turning away students with ATARs that, you know, years ago, you know, five years ago we would have taken them in, but there aren't enough places for me to take them in. So are they heading abroad or just into completely different areas of study? Yeah, so, so what's happening is students who don't get in, they'll take their second choice. Often that'll be science or arts or business. And unfortunately, um, we don't have an over-demand uh, for science or arts or business. They are great degrees, but we are not crying out for them the way that we are crying out for engineers. Earlier you gave the number of 6,100 per year. Yep. Where do we get that number? So what we did is we looked at um, the OECD average, which is where we would like to be, and we calculated what that number would be. It's a pretty simple calculation, and that's where we came up with that number. Okay, and so your, your professional... I should also correct myself. We also looked at um, where we should have gone if we had kept up with the um, growth... Uh, if we had, if we as a nation had increased the growth of engineers to be at the same level where we were as a percentage in, in prior to 2014, we would need that number. Okay, and, and so you, a lot of your background is in human-robot interaction. Yep. Can you just tell me a little bit about where the mining sector is heading in that direction? So uh, robotics is a big part of the uh, growing mining sector and the, the challenges that we, we face is anything that we can automate completely, we've done it, <laughs> okay? Anything that um, is highly structured, like in the automobile industry, we've got robots for that. 
The challenge is that the mining industry, the resource industry, highly unstructured. You're in landscapes, things aren't square, um, things change, and so you still need the operator there to understand what the situation is, but you also want to bring in the automation to keep people safe and to increase your productivity. So when you have automation and robotics and you have people, the most important thing is to design the systems to help them work together seamlessly. That is the work that I'm doing right now. Uh, we're moving along in that area, but we're not there yet. Um, it's a big field of study. Um, what I'm very interested in Monash is to, we are developing a robotics uh, degree. And one of the reasons we're doing that is we see a huge opportunity for engineers uh, to develop the skills to be able to design systems that operators can use in the mining industry. Is Australia a world leader in this area? Uh, is <laughs> okay. I think uh, Australia has certain areas of fantastic expertise in robotics, a very, very strong machine vision. Um, absolutely fantastic in um, the work that is done in automated mining. I mean, um, the work that's been done by uh, BHP, for Fortescue, Rio Tinto, in terms of adopting and using the latest uh, robotics technology, they are world leaders. They are fantastic. In other areas, we need to build strength, and we will continue to do that. Okay, and so there is a lot of automation on mines today, so yep. I guess I'm asking for a bit of a judgment call, but how far do you think we are from seeing fully automated mines around the world? As I said, it's a very unstructured world. We will always have the need um, for human in the loop. It's a very important thing. If we don't continue to use a good quality judgment, um, and I was at an AI uh, conference earlier today down in uh, down at Monash, and one of the things that we see right now is the AI is very good for segmented problems, but when we get into complex multi-segment problems, AI falls down because we just don't have the the depth of being able to put the the systems together to make those complex decisions. So. Um, we have not got to the place uh, at all where we will be removing the operator from the loop. What we will be doing is we'll be pulling the operator back from the danger as we're doing. Um, we will be empowering them with AI supported information and we will be helping them to make better decisions. And that's where I think the right place is for us to go. So there's always going to be a lot of jobs in mining, you say? I always see the opportunity for jobs in mining. One of the things, though, I will see is that um, the jobs are going to be ones where people are going to be using a lot more of their brains and a lot less of their muscle. I think that's a good thing because what that means is we're um, keeping people safe, giving them quality, interesting jobs, um, and giving them jobs that... Uh, result in high productivity and, and better um, pay for people, which I think is very important, um, and a better outcome uh, for Australia and for uh, the many industries on which we depend. And so this, of course, naturally links back to your argument about the number of engineers that we need. So, right. So we need more engineers because we're going to need them um, the, to not only to design the new systems, but to handle these much more complex roles. So really this is all about upskilling our workforce and giving them the ability to play at the very top end uh, of the, uh, the resources spectrum. Okay, and so I'll finish up on a very broad question, but what, what would you say would be the most exciting thing to look forward to in AI and mining in the next decade? Well, I think there's a huge opportunity in AI and mining to look at tailings. Because one of the things that um, 
uh, we know is that tailings uh, have a very rich, still have a very rich mineral content, but we haven't figured out how to extract that yet. So being able to use the data that we have about our waste and coming up with smart ways, not only with AI, but with new, te new um, filtration technology, new commutation technology, new ways of um, uh, processing the material to actually get the maximum value from something that we thought was waste. Isn't that fantastic? I just think that we, we can do a lot more um, in using um, our technology and our AI to develop a much more sustainable and smaller mining footprint and still drive much more value from uh, the outcomes of the work that we do. Fantastic. Well, we'll wrap it up there then. Thank you so much for spending the time to have a chat with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And once again, I'm Scott Tibbles with the Investing News Network, and we've been reporting from the floor of IMARC.